All right. Well, thank you. Um, so this time we're also talking about fuzzing. Unfortunately, uh, the original person who was supposed to give this talk didn't make it into the United States. He's still alive. Don't be afraid of that, but he didn't get into the United States, so I have to give this talk. And it's actually mostly his master thesis that this research is based on. Um, and it is, again, a fuzzing talk. So we talk a bit about fuzzing. Uh, historically, there were basically two kinds of fuzzer, mutational fuzzers, which take an input, apply a mutation, and um, execute it, and then hope for a crash. And there's general, uh, generative fuzzers, which try to generate a whole bunch of inputs without mutating and hoping for a crash. Now, uh, the former ones need a seed corpus, and the latter ones need a description of how to generate uh, inputs. And um, along comes AFL, which is a mutational fuzzer, but adds this fast code coverage, where uh, an input program is considered, and uh, inputs are generated by mutating existing seeds. They are fed into the program, and the coverage is observed. And if there was new coverage, then we store the input, and this process is repeated. And uh, inputs that do not trigger new coverage are discarded. And um, this fills up a queue of inputs that trigger interesting coverage. Um, now, if we have a look at what programs often do, so we, previously we talked about those off common um, roadblocks, and now we talk a bit more of a uh, global structure where many programs that are not like super binary focused, but more the text based programs, have a dedicated parsing stage. Then they perform a set of checks, such as type checks or um, stuff like that. And then they actually consume the data structure that was parsed and, and analyzed. Now, AFL is really good at exploring code paths in the parser. However, it has a really hard time to get a diverse set of inputs through to the later stages of the program execution. And our goal is to build a fuzzer that is able to explore those uh, later parts of the program. And uh, basically, the idea is use two old ideas, combine them, and then hopefully find that the combination is better than each part individually. And in that case, we use grammar fuzzers, which are well known, and feedback fuzzing in the style of AFL, which is also well known, and combined them and found that this combination is actually much more powerful than each individual approach. Um, as a quick recap, context-free grammars are going to be quite present in this talk. So basically, context-free grammars are a set of production rules where the left-hand side consists of a single non-terminal and the right-hand side consists of any sequence of non-terminals here displayed in all caps and terminal symbols, which we here display in lowercase. Um, so for example, here we have this, the production rule that says, okay, an expression can be the sum of any two expressions. And we can use such a grammar to create something that's called an abstract syntax tree, where uh, the derivation rules form a tree. And this tree can be unparsed into a concrete input. In this case, we have a statement. A program turns into a statement. The statement turns into assignment. The assignment has a variable and an expression on the right-hand side. And the variable is a, and the expression on the right-hand side is 1. And we can use these trees. And our fuzzer is completely based on using these trees. So we do not. Uh, unlike AFL, we do not store the inputs. We store this tree representation. And we build a fuzzer implemented in Rust that is basically using the same instrumentation as AFL does uh, to, to get a binary that gives us feedback on the coverage. Uh, and it takes a grammar as an input and then uses that for fuzzing. So something that's interesting and different from other approaches is that we do not really use seed files. So all existing or most existing grammar fuzzers also use seed files, but that has the significant disadvantage that the grammar that you provide actually has to be able to parse the seed files. Um, and I don't know how many of you have been written, uh, writing grammars for real world languages. It's not fun, particularly if you want to have a grammar that is actually a valid grammar for something like JavaScript that parses all the test cases that can be quite annoying. Um, so we don't do that. So the first step that our fuzzer does is it generates a whole bunch of inputs because it doesn't have seed inputs to begin with. And we do that um, by, so there's two ways to do that, or a few more ways to do that, but we've implemented two. There's naive generation, which just picks a random tree. So it, we start with the root node, and then we derive, we apply random rules. 
This has, however, a significant disadvantage because in this case, for example, half of the random derivations are going to be return one. So that means that nearly half of the programs or the inputs that we trigger using naive generation are simply the statement return one. Now that wastes a lot of the compute that we spent on fuzzing. Um, and we uh, added a ring buffer that says, okay, don't execute inputs that we saw within the last 10,000 10, executions. Um, something else we tried was uniform generation. So there's a way you can, that you can actually um, sample uniformly from the set of all possible inputs. And that avoids this issue, but it's, it's a lot more costly. Then uh, we execute the input that we generated. And hopefully, eventually, we find an input that triggers new coverage. And as that happened, um, or after that happened, the first step is that we minimize the input. And uh, since we have a grammar, or we, we actually operate on the tree, we can minimize much more aggressively than AFL does. Um, and the first minimization step is just try to replace each node, each subtree, by the smallest possible subtree for this non-terminal. Um, so that would look like something like this, where uh, the statement is replaced by the smallest possible statement, which just contains a single non-terminal uh, terminal symbol. And then we have recursion minimization, where we take a recursion, such as the uh, nested occurrences of expressions inside of this tree, um, and basically move up in the tree. So the, the left-hand side is moved up to the root, uh, towards the root, and some of the stuff that was used on the right-hand side of the expression is then discarded. Um, and this allows us to drastically shrink the input. So it's not uncommon for inputs to start out as multiple kilobytes and then shrunk, being shrunk down to like 100 bytes of input or something like that. Um, then they're stored in the queue, and eventually uh, the scheduler picks some of the inputs from the queue as it did with AFL, and we apply mutations to this input. And there's, again, mutations based on the tree structure, mostly. Um, so one is a random mutation. The random mutation simply uh, replaces a random subtree with another random subtree that was generated newly. Then we have the rules mutation, which tries at every position all possible alternative rules, which is really useful to enumerate symbols, for example. So if you have a rule that says, OK, the ID or the method name could be one of the following five symbols, then you can try the brute force all five possible symbols as method names. We have random recursive mutation, um, which basically is the inverse operation to the recursive minimization, where we pick a recursive occurrence, such as the expression nodes on the left-hand side, and basically nest them deeper. Then, and this is quite important actually, we have a splicing mutation, which recombines inputs that are already in the queue in ways such that they actually perform, generate syntactically valid uh, new inputs. And lastly, we have an AFL mutator that performs bit flips and mutations similar the way AFL does that. Uh, this mutator will produce invalid trees. And we just hope that we're still going to be fine. So um, this helps us occasionally to uncover some features that were not part of the grammar. And then we can use splicing to introduce these features in other contexts. But sometimes that just introduces, for example, a new closing bracket that will completely invalidate the rest of the parsing. Um, but it's still helpful. Um, after we implemented that, obviously, we also evaluated it. Uh, we picked four targets and wrote custom grammars, uh, the first one being MRuby, then PHP, Lua, and Chakra Core. Chakra Core is the JavaScript engine used in uh, Edge, so the second most recent Internet Explorer iteration or something like that, I don't know. Um, and uh, we compared against other fuzzers. Uh, and as you can see, so this is not basic block coverage. This is actual percentage of the branches in the program. Um, and as you can see, uh, the other fuzzers hardly were able to improve over the baseline except for uh, Lua, where AFL was actually able to find significant amounts of coverage. Baseline in that case were uh, 1,000 inputs that we randomly generated from the grammar, as well as we gave all other fuzzers uh, the whole set of strings that we used inside of the grammar as a dictionary. Um, now the question obviously is, um, why do we perform so much better? Is that maybe just because we use a grammar? Or is it actually due to a combination of grammar and feedback, which would be our contribution? 
and we performed another experiment in which we uh, evaluated different configurations. And in that case, again, we have the baseline, which is basically a thousand random inputs from the grammar. Then we configured Nautilus to use no feedback at all, so it just keep generating new inputs, mirroring the approaches of previous generative fuzzers. And as you can see, that actually helps. It in increases the, the overall coverage uh, above baseline. Um, however, using feedback drastically increases the performance in most cases more than doubling the new coverage that was found. Um, additionally, we evaluated the two generation modi, um, namely naive generation and uniform generation. And as you can see, um, the difference are rather small and the complexity of the uh, uniform generation is actually rather high. Sometimes it takes like 10 minutes just to generate all the data that you need to perform efficient uniform generation. And uh, therefore we actually opted to not use the uniform generation uh, afterwards. Uh, we also had a look at the different um, at the different operators or mutators and how effic efficient they are, are um, at finding new coverage over time. So the time axis is actually somewhat weird. So this is kind of a pseudo logarithmic something issue um, because towards the end of the campaign we need a lot more um, time to actually get a noise free sample of how, uh, how many inputs were found. And the interesting thing about this graphics is that in the beginning, generation and minimization are actually the techniques that find most of the inputs, but as we continue with the fuzzing, uh, splicing becomes more and more important. Um, to give an intuition for that, here's an example that, or an example input from the Q4M Ruby. And what this piece of code does is, it iterates over all objects that are alive on the heap, and then tries to call a method on this object. And this fragment is really, really helpful for the fuzzer because the fuzzer can now try to call a method on any object and it doesn't have to like, get the types right, basically. And then the splicing is able to recombine gadgets like these into programs where multiple methods are called sequentially without having to actually figure out which object to call the method on. All right, so we also found some bugs. Um, MRuby, so if you want to uh, look at a target where it's actually fun to evaluate against, then MRuby is the way to go because they have this bug bounty program and they're like super, super cooperative. Um, so we ended up with lots of CVEs and uh, also some bug bounties that Daniel won. Um, we found also bugs in PHP. The PHP people are less cooperative. I think they mostly gave up on uh, building a memory safe interpreter. Um, then in Lua, we found the use of the free that was a regression that was fixed earlier. And in Chakra Core, we also found an issue, but that was only relevant to the Linux version where uh, the Microsoft people tried to implement a custom column convention using VR, VA arcs, which uh, worked about as well as you would expect. Uh, conclusion, grammars and feedbacks are a pretty good combination, so there's still quite a bit of space for fuzzers to grow because if you add the grammar, then you're like much, you will get a much stronger fuzzer. And splicing is really important, and I think most of our community so far neglected to look at splicing. We've been focusing on the uh, roadblocks very much, but actually the splicing, I think, is where lots of the deeper uh, things become interesting, or the deeper code coverage and deeper into the state machine of the program becomes interesting. All right, so that's it for my side. There's an overview about the topics, topics that I talked about. Um, please feel free to ask any question. So Chris, what's the line? Cornelius is still fresh after light talks. So. <laughs> um, Okay, so I mean, as you mentioned, like uh, generating a grammar can be a pain, right? Yes. Um, and here in some sense, you leverage the fact that they are already available um, to some degree with some tweaks, if I understand correctly, that you may need yeah. to do. So um, we used, we also provided a converter that can convert until our grammars into the format that we use. However, we made some pretty bad experiences with that because um, and like grammars, for example, they strip white spaces because they are already removed in the tokenization pa uh, pass. And thus it's like 
actually we, we figured that it's easier to write a new grammar that focuses on the aspects that you're interested in than it is to convert those ANTLR grammars into something that's actually useful. Um, additionally, we made some very good experiences with actually writing custom grammars that are not trying to cover the whole program, but only a small subset of features where we actually suspect that they could be implemented wrong or where that there could be um, interactions that actually are leading to bugs. So for example, um, in, in the case of MRuby, our grammar did not even contain uh, uh, rules for integers. It basically just contained a set of integers that we deemed interesting, like very small one, very large ones, and that's it. So there was basically just a few dozen integers to choose from. And there's, for example, the big list of naughty strings, which is really helpful, because you don't actually care about like most of the string literals that could be produced by a grammar, uh, because most of them are not interesting. And I mean, it's kind of like noticeable that, or may maybe the number of uh, bugs that you find here seems like smaller compared to, like, to the previous fuzzers that we've seen correct, here. Yes. And that, uh, could that actually be related to the fact that you are only testing like a subset of the grammar of the programs? Or should we actually think that they are actually safer than a... Uh, I don't think they're value. actually safer. So, uh, well, let's say Chakra Core is probably a lot more safe than, I don't know, like uh, object dump, for example, simply because the bug bounties for like JavaScript interpreters are pretty damn high these days. Um, but I think the biggest difference is that Nautilus uh, was evaluated during the master thesis of Daniel, and Red Queen was evaluated about one year. Um, that's why I dislike the metric of bugs, because bugs is basically, you can still find a very large amount of bugs just using AFL without any modification. So the number of bugs that you find is a pretty bad metric to judge a paper by, um, because that basically judges you based on the amount of work that you spend into like looking into software, triaging bugs, and reporting them, which I do not think is a valuable academic contribution. I mean, it's a valuable social contribution because it makes everyone safer off, but um, I don't think that's uh, a very good metric to, to judge puzzles by. Okay, thank you. Since there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.